Hey, everybody. I'm so glad that you could join us today. I'm very excited to interview my friend Alan Parr about his new book called Misled. I had the honor of reading this book and endorsing it. Um, so I'm really excited to have Alan on today to talk about it. I've been waiting for this interview for a while. Alan, thank you so much for coming on my channel and talking to me about your brand new book today. Hey, Melissa, I am so very excited. Um, as you guys know, Melissa and I have done some collaborations together, mm -hmm. uh, mostly on my channel, but I'm excited to come on your channel. I can't thank you enough for having me on today, as well as uh, reading. You were the first person to actually read the whole book all the way through, which is crazy. Mm -hmm. And thank you so much for the endorsement as well. So looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, I found the book really inspiring, actually. And I remember a uh, we talked a little bit about you writing this book and what it took for you to write it. And it's always so interesting to me to learn about the journeys that authors go through and how much work goes into this, you know? So it's not just a little project book writing. So, but um, let's jump into it though. There's certain aspects of your book that I particularly enjoyed. And one of them that I found surprising was the introduction of all things. Like you jumped off the book with a really surprising introduction and, uh, you share some personal reasons for wanting to write this book. And I'm wondering if you could tell us about some of them. Yeah. So, um, you know, the inspiration for this book, I really tell people that this book has really been writing itself for mm. the past 30 years or so. And I didn't even realize it. Um, you know, mm. I'll take people back to maybe 1993 or so, which is dating me. I'm kind of uh, telling my age here. But when I went to college, <laughs> um, I didn't have really any desire to be in church I grew up in church, but I didn't really, um, really didn't have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ until I would probably say my sophomore year, because my whole freshman year, I didn't go to church at all. So my sophomore year, um, I started attending a church, uh, which happened to be a charismatic church, which, um, you know, I'm not necessarily opposed to charismatic churches in general or anything like that. But this particular church happened to be a charismatic church. And there were some things that were happening at this church that let's just say, were not biblical, but I was not in a place where I knew truth from error. I wasn't biblically literate enough to really discern whether the things that I was seeing going on in this church were actually true to Scripture or whether things were unhealthy and, and toxic, until a couple of things happened, um, you know, to me and some of my friends. Um, you know, one of the things is that, you know, there was some sort of exorcism that was happening. They were trying to push me down uh, and lay hands on me. They were trying to force me to speak in tongues, um, kind of treated me a little differently whenever I wasn't falling down in the middle of service and uh, submitting to being slain in the spirit. And yeah. they had this type of mentality that you were kind of a second class JV Christian if you didn't speak in tongues. And mm -hmm. there was all sorts of prophetic words that were being spoken throughout um, the church services. They bring prophets in and do these types of things. And then, of course, I had this really horrible experience where the pastor was trying to make advances at me and all these different type of things that I talk about a little bit in the book. And so mm -hmm. the bottom line is that I didn't have a, a reference for how to process whether the things that were happening in this church were, once again, biblical or not. And I found myself kind of going down this path where um, I was confused and mm -hmm. I ended up staying in that church for about three or four years until uh, the Lord gave me the wisdom, the insight, and the courage to kind of break fellowship with that church. And I, I say all that because my heart really goes out to a lot of people uh, who are in church environments like that, who maybe they don't know what's going on at their church is actually not biblically accurate. And so I wanted to write a book that would help people discern whether the things that they're experiencing in their Christian life, whether it be in church or outside of church, are true or whether they should stay at that church, whether they should continue to believe these things or whether they need to try to find a different place to go. Yeah. Yeah. And what's uh, also really unique about the the way that you wrote it is uh, you, through a fictional character, Jaron, you kind of put him through the ringer every chapter, you know, just fictionally finding each church that depicts what these seven areas are and it was so <laughs> i remember uh, kind of chuckling to myself thinking wow poor jaron you know this poor kid going through each one of these churches and just being duped every time but the cool thing about it is that uh i believe that people do go through those things i think that you depicted him and the character and what he goes through um very well and so i think that's one reason why i think a lot of you guys can relate to this is that it's not just 
like an informative book, but there's also like a fictional kind of storyline in, in each chapter that I think everybody would enjoy. Now, speaking of uh, the seven areas, all right, you cover seven areas of uh, where Christians can be misled. And in your opinion, out of these seven areas, what do you think is the biggest threat to the church right now? Well, man, that's like asking mm -hmm. me to choose my favorite child, right? <laughs> um, as yeah, you I, know, are, I think you... I know what mine is, but yours, you know. Okay, might okay. Be a well, we might be aligned. I, well, we may not be actually. Um, you know, know. I, there, there, are, there are several that I could point to, but I'm, I'm going to probably go with chapter five, which I talk about the dangers of progressive Christianity, as I know that oh, that is okay, something yeah. that you yeah. and I are both very passionate about, as well as our colleague and friend, uh, Lisa Childers, has done some great work, mm -hmm. which I cite a few times in this book. But, you know, as you know, that I think the reason why this is the biggest threat is because um, it can be misleading for people who think that they are Christian and it paints this picture that they can have the best of both worlds, right? I can have Jesus, but I can have Jesus on my own terms. I yeah. can have Jesus, but I can also stay in my LGBTQ lifestyle. I can I can stay in whatever state that I'm in. I can deny the work and person of Jesus Christ. Um, I can cherry pick which parts of the Bible that I would like to apply to my life but I still can go to heaven and have Jesus. And I think that is a very, very dangerous um, teaching that is on the rise. Many churches are becoming more progressive. If you go to a church and you go to their website and you see the word, you know, we are a welcoming, inclusive, progressive church. I just want to yep. let you guys know, for watching, whoever watching this, if you see that, those are red flags to let you know that um, that's a church that you probably want to avoid. And I give several examples of how um, churches um, or becoming more and more progressive. So I would probably have to say that's probably to me the, the either that or probably chapter seven. <laughs> what was chapter seven in again? It was free grace. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Chapter seven was this idea that, you know, you can be a Christian and not grow and yeah. um not have any sort of discipleship type of um relationship with Christ. And uh, I know some people have different views on that, but my position is pretty simple, that if you are a follower of Christ and you are a child of God and you truly are a, um, a genuine believer, that there should be fruit that follows your life, um, and that should be exemplified through a true relationship with Christ and a discipleship experience. Yeah. Amen to that. Yeah. Um, I actually think I just changed my mind. I think I agree with you. I think that a uh, progressive Christianity out of all you, all the things that you wrote, uh, is the biggest threat because it comes in so many different forms and you can still take on these, even new age beliefs, new thought beliefs. You can do all these things and basically be a progressive Christian. So I, I think you're right. Uh, there is one chapter though, that really stood out to me that I found really satisfying. I, I think maybe that's the right word. As I was reading it, I'm like, wow, this is so satisfying that he wrote it this way and uh, tackled it this way because you're not just coming at them. You come at it with, with, with love, but also truth. You're firm, but you're fair. And uh, chapter three, it's about being able to speak things into existence. And I practice this in new age, new thought, mostly new thought, because this is more new thought practice. Um, and I see this a lot in the church. In fact, I saw it in the church before I even realized there's a word for it, before I realized the things that I know now. I'm wondering if you can talk about this, about positive confession um, and why this is problematic. Yeah, yeah, it's so problematic, Melissa. Um, as you know, uh, so for those who may not be familiar with, <clears throat> excuse me, what positive confession is, this is a false doctrine that is being promoted by um, many proponents or members of the Word of Faith movement, um, and it's the idea basically comes from the, the premise that um, in Genesis chapter 1, the Bible talks about we were created in the image of God, right? And so um, if God has creative power with His words, if He used His words to create the world, let there be light and there was light, he makes man in his own image. He creates the, an, the, the animals and stars and galaxies, everything. So if God can speak things into existence with his words, and if you and I were created in the image of God, then as many Word of Faith proponents would um, propose, 
that that means that we are little gods. And they'll even take um, Scripture out of context in Psalm 82, where it talks about uh, ye are gods and things of that nature, which I debunk in this book. Um, but essentially, it's the idea that we also, with our words, have the ability to create certain things. We can create our reality. We can create the type of life that we want with speaking words into exist or speaking things into existence. And it's is a very dangerous practice because there's there's positive confession, and on the other side, there's like negative confession, which is the idea that you know you have a lot of Christians who are afraid of speaking anything negative over their life. So if you're sick. You don't want to speak that over your life. As a matter of fact, uh, Melissa, um, there have been uh, on record um, accounts of Christians, Christian couples who have gotten married and have removed the words in sickness and in health out of their uh, wow. wedding vows because they don't want to even acknowledge that sickness could be a part of their life because they don't want to speak sickness into their life, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, for richer or for poorer, they remove the poorer because they don't want to speak poverty over. The, so it's this fear. Wow. It's this crazy fear that like, look, if you're sick, you should be able to say you're sick. When you look at the Psalms, David was not afraid to speak that he was depressed or he was upset or mm -hmm. he was afraid, right? Like, no, you see this in the, in the Bible. So uh, this idea of positive confession is very, very dangerous because um, it really communicates a false view of faith that if I have enough faith, and not faith in God, but faith in my words and my ability to create this, then I can have the reality that I want. And as a, and then you and I, we could talk a little bit more about the other side of positive confession, which is probably a little bit more new thought, which is this idea of manifestation. And that seems mm -hmm. to be the new buzzword that's going on. And you might be able to shed a little bit of light on that, uh, because that definitely comes straight from uh, New Age New Thought. Yeah, you have a little excerpt on manifestation too, yes. and in yeah, like a I'm not no I don't know the fancy book word for it, but it's a little title about manifesting under positive confession, and it was really well done, like uh, succinctly pointed out the problems with it, why this is an issue. So it's really hard for some people to take things like oh positive confession or anything where somebody claims the name Christian and then they use a Bible verse to pack it up. You know, where it's like, hey, that Matthew 7, 7 says this, uh, Mark, I believe it's like Mark 6, uh, you know, ask, speak, believe, ask and have faith. You will receive it. Thanks for that. I think that a lot of people can kind of relate to it where in pop culture and society, uh, they can compare it to the law of attraction, which uses yes. the same exact scriptures and the same exact arguments, um, even the same definition of faith, faith being a power where you can create things and so yeah, guys, it's sus. It's very, very sus. It it presumes that we know what's best for our lives, right? Mm -hmm. Like for me to manifest something, which by the way, um, guys, manifesting is focusing more on like your thoughts, right? Like thinking new, thinking things, um, thinking good things, having good thoughts, having good energy, uh, meditating mm -hmm. on the right things, which the Bible talks about meditating, but your object of meditation should be God and not on some of these other things. Whereas speaking things into existence folks a little bit more on like my words and what I say and the power of my words, the power of life and death is in the tongue, take that out of context and things of that nature. So manifesting, Oh, I manifested my house. I manifested my boyfriend. I manifested my, my, my child. I manifested my new career. I manifested my six figure income. When you're trying to manifest something, you're assuming that you know that this is God's perfect will for your life. Instead, what we should be doing is going to God and saying, "The Lord, Lord, this is what I want to happen for me, but mm -hmm. nevertheless, not my will, let yours be done. And hopefully you all are seeing the difference between that approach, going to God in prayer, submitting your will to his, but asking him for what you want, petition, which is biblical, versus stating, I'm going to, I am going to manifest this in my life because I have already made up the decision, this is what's best for me. And I'm not going to regard what I think or what God thinks is best for me. And that's that can be very dangerous. Yeah. You know, and it, it was something else that's really interesting to point out here is that I've noticed that sometimes a lot of the, the, this bad theology starts with having a wrong identity of who God is um, in classical theism, which is a fancy seminary word, but basically the attributes of God, like who is God. And one of the things that um, they they 
draw a conclusion from is that God only ever wants you to go through good things, right? So if God is good all the time and he only ever wants you to have good things, then you must always have good things. So in that theology and that perspective, that informs their perspective of how their life should be. The problem is, is that that's not exactly how, how God works at all. Um, and if what classical theism does is that it, you go to the Bible and work back from the Bible. <laughs> and then that informs you how God sees things like suffering and evil and poverty. And the, the constant theme is that he never leaves you or forsakes you. And in his sovereignty allows things to happen for his good, for his glory. You know, and so that that doesn't nece necessitate us never feeling um, any sort of poverty or sickness or anything like that. So it really does have to do with a proper view of the attributes of God and his identity. And I noticed they they don't have that that view correct at all. But yeah, chapter three uh, really, yeah. really spoke to me because I'm, I'm glad to see somebody really writing about this. Um, and and contrasting it with the bible so speaking of that i always believe that to co uh, combat bad theology is with good theology and i notice that there's a parallel between people who are misled and those who aren't for the most part is those who are biblically literate versus those who are not and it's almost like the more biblically literate somebody is the more discernment they would have like oh this isn't something isn't right here let me ask uh what your thoughts are about the Bible study principles that you would give to my viewers and your readers uh, for how to avoid deception and being misled. Yeah, yeah, that's a great that's a great question. Um, you know, so um, I always try to make it very very simple, and I would probably uh, use what I would call a three C approach, right? A three C approach, um, and the first C is context, right? And as you and I know, like. Context is king. Uh, there's an old saying that um, if you take the text out of context, you get conned, right? Um, <laughs> That's I, good. I, I, right. I mean, just I know that might have been like over people's heads, but like just take the word text out of the word context and what's left? Con, C-O-N, right? That's like what happens that, yeah. whenever we take the text out of context. And most of these false teachings that I highlight in this book are a result of taking verses out of context. Let me give you a perfect example, right? Um, 3 John 2, uh, I don't have my Bible. Actually, I do. Um, 3 John 2, right? I mean, like, it literally just says here, like, let me just see if I can find it here real quick. Pastor Parr with getting out his Bible. Yes, good. we have to. This is Bible <laughs> class, right? 3, 3 John says, Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. Now, another uh, verse might say, uh, I pray that you uh, prosper, right, as your soul prospers. So many people will take that out of context and say, see, it must be God's will that we have to prosper in all things because this clearly says that, you know, John is praying that this person would prosper. It's like, wait a second. John is writing this to a person whose name is Gaius, and he's greeting him saying, hey, I hope all is well with you, and I pray that you're prospering or you're getting along well in all things, just as your soul is, is, is doing well. It would be like me saying, hey, Melissa, I hope you're doing well today. I'm praying for all things. I'm praying for good things. But that is not a promise from God that prosperity is going to come your yeah. way. It's just me greeting you in a letter. So that's a perfect example, one of many um, taking verses out of context. Um, so, um, another easy one that we just talked about is Romans chapter four, verse 17, where it talks about God is the one who's able to call those things that are not as though they are. He's able to give life mm -hmm. to the dead, right? That passage is clearly talking about God giving life to Sarah's womb because Sarah's womb was dead. It was barren. And God is the only one that's able to call life or call something into existence, which is not, i.e. Isaac their unborn child, right? But nowhere in Romans 4 does it say that you and I have the ability to call those things that are not as though they are or speak something okay. into existence. But people take these verses and completely rip them out of context. That's the first principle. The second principle would be cross-reference, right? Um, mm -hmm. So if you have a passage of scripture or a scripture that's like confusing and you're like, I'm not quite sure what that means, 
Don't build your theological principles on that confusing passage. Instead, ask yourself the question, are there other verses in the Bible that are clear about this topic, whatever it may be, speaking things into existence, salvation, uh, health and wealth, whatever it is that you're, you're, you're searching for, and let the clear verses interpret or shed light on the verses that are not so clear because the Bible can't contradict itself. It can't say one thing over here and one thing over there. The last C mm -hmm. I would give people is consultation. You and I can read the Bible and we could think, oh, the Spirit of the Lord just showed this to me. Oh, man, I got a revelation from God, right? Oh, Lord, thank yeah. you for that, 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 that rhema moment, that rhema word for me. Okay, cool. Slow down and consult a commentary. Consult a Bible dictionary. Consult a biblical pastor or somebody and get a different perspective to see if God has shown anybody else throughout the history of time the same thing that you think that God has shown you in this passage because there's safety in community because God mm -hmm. has blessed other scholars to be able to have insight into what the word of God has to say. If you apply those three principles, I think you'll guard yourself mostly on um, being led astray by false teaching. Yeah, it sounds like a, a really good crash course in hermeneutics. Just basically <laughs> knowing how to, yeah, knowing how to read the Bible. Um, in the grammatical, historical, consistent context, because uh, nobody nobody reads any other book like that. You know, it's 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 reading it um, in the perspective that, of the authors, and in even the way that you pointed out the prayer. You know, like, hey, I, I wish that you would prosper. I pray that you would prosper, and uh, that is a description, not a prescription. You know, and I think that that's these are really good things for Christians to know. Like, how do you describe and prescribe? a verse like how do you know the difference and so um no that was really good and one thing i also wanted to ask you about so i actually got a a recent question about this one and i would love to get your thoughts on it it's about prophecy and and prophets which you have a whole chapter on um now first can you tell us what biblical prophecy is um and then second what it is not yeah yeah so, um, you know, thank you for that question. Uh, that's chapter four, by the way, guys, of the book. Mm -hmm. I have a whole chapter about prophecy. And um, spoiler alert, um, my, my position is not that the gift of prophecy has ceased. I am not personally a cessationist, although mm -hmm. um, if you are and you hold to that view, I totally respect you and I see where you get that position. Um, I yep. am lean more to, to uh, a continuationist. I'm not a charismatic but I'm more in the middle, more of a continuationist, meaning I do believe that um, the gift of prophecy is continued for today, but how it's being used in the church, I think, in many instances, not in all, um, is doing a lot of harm uh, to the body of Christ and in individual Christians. So, uh, you know, what is prophecy? Well, um, the first thing that I would uh, obviously uh, encourage people to do is look at what the Bible describes prophecy is as you look at the Old Testament. Um, what did the prophets do in the Old Testament? Well, you know, they called out sin, right? They called people to repent, and they warned people of danger and judgment from the hand of God if they did not repent. For that reason, prophets were hated. They were persecuted. They were stoned. They were imprisoned. This was not a glamorous position. Nobody wanted to be a prophet, right? Prophets were not regarded as being um, someone that people liked to, to see coming, right? Um, nowadays, prophets oftentimes act very differently because prophets typically are expected to communicate a prosperous message, a positive message, Mm -hmm. For that reason, which is why when people say, hey, there's a prophet coming to my church, it's packed with people because people are hoping to receive some sort of positive message that will encourage them and tell them that something good is happening in their lives. But that's not mm -hmm. how I see prophecy um, operating in the Bible. I see it the exact opposite, right? Um, fast forward to the New Testament. Uh, prophecy really as it is defined by the Apostle Paul, seems to be focused more on communicating the Word of God to the people of God in a variety of ways, whether that might be me exhorting you, Melissa. Let's just say I, 
I'm your friend and I see something going on in your life and I'm like, hey, I think God has given me a word for you. And that word is that you need to, let's just say you and I are out on a double date. Your, your husband, you, me, and my wife. And let's just say I hear you disrespecting your husband in public, right? And I'm like, you know what? God gave me something that he wants to communicate to you Mm -hmm. that, you know, you need to honor your husband because he's the head of your home. Now, I'm not giving you any new revelation. The Bible, I'm telling you what the Bible says in Ephesians 5. That could be considered a type of prophecy. And that's where you would say, okay, is there any scriptural support here? Uh, Should I receive this as true? Okay, yes. Okay, I need to honor my husband or whatever. And so that is an example. Me preaching the word of God on a Sunday morning, that would be an example of prophecy. Now, what is prophecy not? Well, Mm -hmm. I mean, I could go a lot of different directions here, but I will say this for our listeners. I would be very, very leery of um, prophecies that are very vague in nature. If you go to a church and somebody is standing on stage and they're like, hey, there's someone here who just lost a loved one to cancer, and God wants you to know that He's going to restore you. Uh, he's going to restore you emotionally. He's going to restore you financially. He's going to restore you spiritually. I mean, now, come on, guys, please. Like, I'm not trying to be mean or, like, arrogant, but, like, you. I hope and pray that everybody has a little bit more discernment to know that that is so vague that in a crowd of a 1,000-plus people, undoubtedly there's going to be someone there who probably lost someone to cancer, right? Mm-hmm. And then to say that God's going to restore you, what does that mean? So it needs to be specific, right? If you're going to even remotely take prophecy seriously, the prophet probably needs to come to you with some sort of specific prophecy like the Old Testament prophets did. Mm -hmm. So I could go on and on about this, but, um, you know, we need to be very careful. And I'll say this one last thing. Um, Someone near and dear to me many, many years ago made the mistake of marrying a man who turned out to be very abusive, very destructive, and they end up getting a Mm -hmm. divorce all because her pastor told her that God showed him in a dream that this man was her husband. And so because Mm -hmm. she accepted it, this is my pastor, my spiritual authority, he has to have heard from God, then I don't want to marry him, but my pastor told me he heard from God, so let me go marry this man. This is what's happening in the body of Christ, and it's leading so many people astray. Just I'm I'm passionate about that. No, I love, please go on and on. Um, This is such a topic that I think a lot of people are hungry to know about because they don't know um, how prophecy works. And I'm with you. You and I have very similar views, very similar um, perspectives on so many things and continuationists, um, same thing. And I have yet to see a a proper use of of prophecy. Um, You know, if somebody came up to me and, said, you know, uh, I have a very specific thing to tell you from God. And they, they gave me times, dates, like very specific thing. Maybe it was something personal. I remember I, I made a video about this. Uh, I went to a Sean Bowles prophecy night. I do this all the time. If there's ever anything in my city that, and I have a whole series on this where I go and I visit places I that, that I series. don't always agree with. Oh yeah. It's, it's like, I need to it's do really that fun in my city. Day. Because Dallas, they <laughs> come all the time. So <laughs> you're, you're in Texas too. So there's a lot of fun places we could go to. Um, yes. But there's the, uh, I think of, I always kind of think of as apologists. Um, we're more like journalists sometimes because we want to go and get the, the facts, get the story. And I went to a prophetic night and I kid you not, Alan, it was, it reminded me of a, a cold, re- like psychic reading, a psychic session. There was no specifics. It was very vague. There's, I see numbers. What does this number mean? And I was so unimpressed. And the information given was not extraordinary. There was no new information given to help any of these people just, oh, wow, look, I know this information. And yeah, you and I could, we probably do a whole video just on prophecy um, and not just nagging on it and saying what's wrong with it, but also like, what does biblical prophecy look like? Yeah. Yeah. And I want to add one quick thing on that is sure. that the, the, yeah. I think the reason why it can be very, very um, difficult today is because, you know, back when I was growing up eighties and nineties and things of that nature, we knew who the prophets were and we knew who the mm-hmm. prophets weren't right. You could look at someone and say, okay, this is because oftentimes they would have a title prophet or prophetess. So, so, so we knew who they were. Right. Mm-hmm. But nowadays with the advent of social media, everybody is a prophet. 
You can have your own YouTube channel. You can have your own Instagram. You can go have, you can give people a prophetic word on your Instagram live or your reels and everybody's doing it. So that's why mm-hmm. now more than ever, like a book like this or just discernment in general is so important because, you know, you have to be able to discern, okay, is this prophetic word that I just heard on somebody's Instagram? Is this really something I need to go on or is it not? Um, and there's just so much information out there nowadays um, because of the words God told me, right? I mean, that's, yes. that's the, that, that is the buzzword, God told me. So I want to encourage you all as I care, encourage people in this book, please be careful using the words God told me in your communication. That's all I'm going to say. Amen. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, very well said. Uh, man, I could have you here uh, talking about this book all day. I really enjoyed reading this. It was very inspirational to me in more than one way. Uh, before we sign off, though, I'm wondering if there's anything else that you want to share about your book, uh, about anything related to the topics in there. Is there anything else you want to share about your your amazing book? Yeah, well, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, as you mentioned earlier, guys, I wrote this book um, in hopes of it being um, easy and fun to read and relatable. As uh, Melissa mentioned, um, mm-hmm. there is a fictional character whose name is Jaron. And Jaron uh, really is a compilation of, yeah, poor Jaron, poor Jaron. Mm-hmm. Uh, every chapter, uh, Jaron is trying to find a Bible-based church, and he keeps running into um, churches that are teaching false doctrine, and it leads him further and further away from the truth, which is the inspiration behind this cover. As you see here, this is the cross. This is the the truth, right? This is the gospel, and there are seven arrows that are going away or deviating from that, and that's exactly what happens in our lives. It looks like this, this craziness, whenever we deviate from the truth, we deviate from the Word of God. And so um, I hope that you'll relate to uh, Jaron's journey. Um, But more importantly, I pray that when you read this book, that you read it with an open mind, and essentially you're coming to this with um, openness, and I pray that If not anything at all, it will inspire you to start to question some of those sacred beliefs that you've held near and dear, maybe things that your pastors taught you, maybe things you've grown up for 20, 30 years believing. But if you come to this book with an open heart Mm -hmm. and you say, you know what, hmm, let me just see what, what this has to say and if there's any validity to this, I pray that you'll start to question. And then the second thing I hope is that you'll start to have conversations with people. Hey, screenshot a page or an excerpt from this book and send it to your friend and say, Hey, I don't know if this guy is really onto something or not. Am I, am I tripping? Like, I don't agree with him. Like, what do you think about this chapter? What do you think about this page and have some healthy conversation around it. And uh, I hope that's what people get um, from this book. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Um, where can they order it? Yeah. So, um, it is, uh, well, depending upon when this is going, goes live, it's what's available, uh, whether, pre-order or order at misledbook.com. That's misled, M-I-S-L-E-D-B-O-O-K, book, misledbook.com. And um, you can see there that you can order the book from any, anywhere books are sold, your favorite uh, retailer. And we have a special going on now to help you with biblical literacy, because if you go to that page and you put your information in, in the middle of the screen and you provide your order confirmation number from anywhere you have ordered, we will send you a free biblical literacy course nice. that you can take and you can enroll in and you can get help in learning how to study the Bible and rightly dividing the word of God. So that's our gift to you as a thank you for purchasing the book. Great. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alan. Thanks for writing this book. Thanks for sharing all of this. Thank you for coming on my channel and talking about this. I'm really excited for you guys uh, to read this. Again, I read the whole book. Um, I had the honor of endorsing it. So this is a book that I do believe that you guys will be blessed from. So check out the description because there will be more information there as always. And Alan, again, I want to thank you again for coming on and talking with me. Oh, the pleasure's all mine. Thank you so much, Melissa. And thank you for all of you who are supporting Melissa. She's doing some great work on this channel. Please continue to support her uh, in the ministry that God has given her. And uh, I appreciate the time today.